Finally getting to this review. Mistborn The Final Empire by Brandon Sanderson. Most people know Brandon Sanderson from his work completing the Wheel of Time series, originally started and penned by the late Robert Jordan. The premise of this book is simple. It's like a lot of other fairy tales. A great evil comes and terrorizes the land. A prophesied hero rises up, goes and fights the evil, defeats the evil, 50-50 chance of surviving, and we all live happily ever after. The end. But what if he didn't succeed? What if he died in his quest? What if he was corrupted by the power he had to gain to defeat the beast? Or was turned? What then? That's the very premise that we look at in Mistborn. A thousand years ago, a great beast called the Deepness rose up and threatened the land, killing thousands in its wake. The Lord Ruler, the prophesied hero, rose up, defeated the deepness, and in the process, gained the power of the sliver of infinity. So, what does he do then? Why? He goes to take over the world. Of course! What does he do when he's defeated the world, and got it under his own iron boot? He rewards those who helped him, and he takes those that were opposed to him, and he casts them down into a less than slave state. After that, because he wasn't content doing that, he breaks the land, creating vast deserts around his empire, raises giant mountainous volcanoes whose only job is to spew ash and smoke into the sky at all times, blocking out the sun and making things much harder on everybody else. Kind of a dick move there. Well, the book opens on a plantation. Plantations are common in this world. It's where lords and nobles that haven't quite earned enough status or money to live in the big cities do their work. Now, the Lord Ruler owns practically everything. The land, the sky, technically even the nobles. And he rules everything through the two branches of his government. He has the Steel Ministry's obligators, who are basically bureaucrats with more power than God, and his Steel Inquisitors, who are the policing force. And when I say Steel Inquisitor, the Inquisition from the Spaniards does not even compare. All crimes are punishable by immediate execution by the Steel Inquisitors, regardless of level of infraction. It's kind of another dick move, isn't it? Anyway, so we open up on a plantation where one of the nobles has just struck a very momentous and prestigious deal with one of the major houses in the great cities. And he decides that, well, because he's a lord and he owns all the ska on the land, he's going to take one of the prettiest girls from the hovels and have his way with her later that night. Well, to continue on this trend, as he gazes out, he sees one ska stand up with his back straight and just smile insipidly at him. When he turns to call the guards and the taskmasters, in the few seconds he's turned away, that one man's gone now. Well, we find out through the course of that chapter that man is Kelsier, one of the main characters. You see, Kelsier is a misborn. What is a misborn? Well, a misborn is somebody who's managed to unlock the power of allomancy in his own body. Using allomancy, they can ingest metals and burn them. These are the metals that they have listed in the first book. Iron and steel can allow you to manipulate metal, pushing and pulling on it using your own body's weight as counterbalance. Tin enhances all five of your senses to almost painful detail, making it great for spies and lookouts. And then pewter enhances your physical strength, your healing speed, your durability, and your resilience. And trust me, I'm gonna need it when I get to this piece of shit. So what does this all have to do? Well, you see, Kelsey used to be one of the most famous and powerful thieves in the central city of Luthadel. And then he was captured by the Lord Ruler and sent to the only existing prison 
in this world. The pits of Hathsin, which are giant cracks in the ground, where slaves and prisoners are forced to crawl down inside and mine. There is no term of limit. You are there till you die. And usually, most people make it about a year. So he returns to the city and is met by his right-hand man, Doxon. They exchange pleasantries and talk about a very interesting thing that they have just discovered. Doxon, not long before Kelsey returned to the city, had come across a young girl named Vin. And they step in just in time to stop one of her former crew members from brutally beating her. Why is Vin so important? She's 16. She's 5 foot nothing. 100 soaking wet. Why is anybody going to risk their lives to save this girl? Because she too is a misborn. Maybe I should explain allomancy a little bit more. There are two types of allomancers. You've got your misborn, who can burn any of the allomantic metals. And then you have mistings, which can only burn one single metal. That's the way this stuff works. It's an amazing magic system. After having saved Vin and bringing her into his own thieving crew, he introduces the rest. And all of these guys are the very best at what they do. And Alan answers all. And he introduces the, who's hired them for this current job. The biggest heist he's ever proven. What are they going to do? They're going to overthrow the final empire. throw this giant theocracy that has existed for a thousand years with its immortal ruler, its all-knowing priests, and its all-powerful policing force of the Steel Inquisitors. Sounds crazy, isn't it? Well, it is kind of ambitious. They break it all down, assign everybody a specific job, and, amazingly, they do it. Through the course of this book, you see each stage of this plan take place. Vin infiltrates the nobility, gaining inside information from things. Kelsier starts planting disinformation as a street informant and doing the occasional assassination job. Breeze, a soother, manages to bring in people, using his alamancy to influence them to feel a certain way. Hammond, a thug or pewter arm, gets the job of training these recruits. And Clubs provides a hideout. Now Clubs has an interesting job, as all his purpose is, is to hide them. But it goes beyond providing them a place to hide. Clubs is a smoker. In Alamancy, if you burn copper, you can hide anybody inside of it that wants to burn any metal. Its complement, bronze, allows people to seek allomantic pulses. So by hiding inside of a copper cloud, even if you're burning metals, you're effectively invisible to anybody trying to find you. Well, as the year passes, these plans start taking amazing results. And there are a few hiccups along the way, but Finally, the big day is here. So they're ready to take storm, attack the city. Only, at that point in time, they realize, well, somebody has taken their army and attacked a nearby garrison without clearing it with Kelsier first. On the way back, they're completely and brutally slaughtered, leaving only about a thousand soldiers left that didn't go to the out of the caves they were hiding in. They manage to take them, smuggle them into the city, hide them as sleeper cells, and decide how to go about it next. So now they have to reorganize, start all over again, and do the best they can in the limited time frame. It's at this point in time that some of their contacts and some of their outside help is captured and being brought to execution. Kelsier dives down into the city square 
trying to rescue them, and winds up fighting a Steel Inquisitor. After a terrifying battle where Kelsier beheads the Steel Inquisitor with an obsidian axe, the Lord Ruler decides to make an appearance. Walks up, has a casual conversation with Kelsier, and then kills him with a single backhanded blow. Dick move. Well, there's that. The rest of the crew goes and hides again, trying to figure out what Kelsier was thinking by not even attempting to fight the Lord Ruler. Although most of them see the point. He's the Lord Ruler. He's basically God. He's the sliver of infinity. He's ruled for a thousand years. He's been flayed. He's been burned alive. He's been beheaded, drawn and quartered, all sorts of things through the, through the thousand years he's been around. And all it does is annoy him. Hell, in this confrontation, he's got two spears sticking through his chest. And it's like, I'll sew, the, I'll sew this jacket back up later. Well, it's about that point in time, while they're mourning his loss, that they realize the Ska are flooding, flooding the streets. Talking about how Kelsier, the Lord of the Mists, is with them. And now it is time to rise up. And they realize, plans within plans, wheels within wheels, Kelsier knew the entire time the only way the Ska would be truly brave enough to rise up against the Lord Ruler was if he made them mad enough by giving them somebody to fight for in name, by becoming a martyr and making them believe in him more than the Lord Ruler. It's at this point in time, the team goes into action, organizing the fighting squads, getting everything ready, and Vin decides to make a trek to the, to the Critic Shaw, the palace. Because, well, somebody's got to kill the Lord Ruler. Well, again, some hiccups occur. And she does eventually make it up to the throne room and defeats the Lord Ruler shoving a spear through his chest. His final words, however, do give some pause. As he lay dying, he says, You don't know what I do for you. By killing me, you have doomed yourselves. And there's the end of book one. In book two, nice fledgling little kingdom, the entire empire is broken into splinters, and what should happen? Well, what happens any time the Empire is in splinters? Invading forces! Of course! Luthadel is now being ruled by Kelsier's surviving crew members and ruled over by a young nobleman chosen by the crew. Well, here comes some siege. Two armies ride in, lay siege to the castle, lay siege to the city, and, well, most of this book is about learning how to be a good ruler, dealing with the approaching armies, and what exactly they're going to do about it. It's more of a dry book than the first book. There's a lot of action, a lot of word establishing in the first book. The second book, uh, it's, it's a little more dry. Because you're not establishing anything new, you're dealing with a political environment, which we didn't get a very good look at in the first book. And at the end of it, you find that, well, they're all being played for puppets, as Vin accidentally releases a powerful entity known as Ruin. And the third book, well, basically they got to fight another god. Ruin is set upon destroying the world. And nothing's going to get in his way except for the fact that he can't quite destroy the world without all of his power. And, well, he doesn't know where it is. And, well, he can't quite find it because he can't affect the world without his power and things of that nature. So... He's really not all that much of a god now, is he? It's kind of more of an annoyance, talking people's heads. Throughout the course of this book, we flesh out the rest of the kingdom, reunite the entire empire, 
by conquering it all back, which doesn't make a lot of sense since she just liberated most of it. Hmm. And they s try to fight Ruin. Well, they win. It's a bittersweet w ending, but it's very satisfying. What I really like about these books is Brandon Sanderson drops little hints in all three books that are finally tied together and ended in the last couple of chapters of the third book, Hero of Ages. Things that he mentions and you don't really think much about in the first book might be answered in the second or the third book. And all three stories, while interlocked, are their own separate arcs, setting the stage at the very end for the th next book of the series. And it's very well done. It's not one of those things where you have to read the books that come before to understand the second and third books. Because they'll recap briefly, very briefly, before even going on to how that affected the current situation. And it all just accumulates in Hero of Ages and everything's laid bare from where Kelsier learned about the 11th medal that they talk about in the first book, why Vin is determined to wear her mother's earring, even though she, her mother used it to kill her baby sister, why Sizid is the only survivor of his people, despite the fact that they are hunted nearly to extinction, it explains all of this. And I really like that. I like books that don't have loose ends. And while there are some things that aren't exactly answered in this book, there are things that... They're open-ended. They're not loose ends. They're just open. It left plenty of room for him to go when he does the next book of the series, The Alloy of Law. Now, I'm going to get into that in its own separate review, because it is different enough from this enclosed trilogy that it warrants a separate review. Now, let's talk about this book. Technicality of the writing, it's about a 6 or 7 out of 10. You know, it's, it's detailed, he uses great words, punctuation is spot on, and he doesn't try to dumb down the vocabulary. Even the invented words that he made specifically for these stories aren't that hard to understand. Allomancy, you use alloys to do magic. You know, ferrucamy. Same basic idea. Everything makes sense. And even if you don't recognize a word, you can understand what it means in context. It may not be as highly technical as, say, James Joyce, Hemingway, anybody that wrote Stream of Consciousness in very elaborate, detailed pages, but it does do enough of showing that this world comes alive to you. It's very immersive. The only times I would put these books down was if I had to go do something, or if I had to go to sleep, go to work. And these are four or five, six hundred page books, depending on which edition and which, you know, hardback or softback. So what else do we have about this? Well, originality. That's a nine, eight, eight or nine on the scale. I mean, it still follows the standard gamut of big evil destroy you know threat big evil threatens world hero rises and then it takes a delicious detour as the hero becomes the villain and now you have a whole new thing of thieves that try to do the right thing so it's got a nice original plot and it's got an original magic system i've never seen magic systems in any other book that follow the rules of physics and it makes sense, you know, with iron and steel, you can only push or pull directly towards you or away from you. You can't make it fly at an angle from you, you can't make it levitate. It, it, you know, they follow the laws of physics. And that's something that I've never seen in a magic system before. Uh, plot, there are a few small little tiny loopholes, but they're small enough that they don't really affect the overall flow. It, you, you sit there, you see the hole, and you're like, well, who cares? What am I talking about? Well, you know, Vin, for the, her first 16 years, 
was beaten and she was told never to trust anybody because they're going to betray you at any moment. She grows up looking for the betrayal because she thinks it's coming no matter what. But two months after being rescued by Kelsier, she trusts him almost implicitly. You know, two months is a long time to break that kind of conditioning. It, it's not going to happen. It's, it, it's too quick. It's too, you know, she should still have minor distrust at, at that point in the book. But it goes along with it, pretty much anything people say. So, where do I stand on this book as a whole? Each book is about a 4 out of 5 on my scale. And the entire trilogy itself, solid 5. Because of what gets wrapped up, what gets revealed, what gets final ended through everything. I highly recommend the Mistborn trilogy. It starts... Mistborn, the Final Empire, goes on to Well of Ascension, Hero of Ages. Go out, find them, buy them. Next time we're going to take a look at the book Child of the Ghosts by Jonathan Mullen. Day is here. They're about to go collect their army and start storming the city walls. I know it's dangly and I know it's fun to play with. So they're ready to take the storm.